So um, I'll go ahead and I'll welcome everyone to the K-State uh, lecture series, Cases and Careers in Veterinary Medicine. And uh, today we have uh, Dr. Susan Nelson. She is going to address the topic of those creepy Corolli parasites that affect cats and dogs. Uh, Dr. Nelson is a clinical prep professor at the Pet Health and Nutrition Center at K-State Manhattan and join us, joins us live there from Manhattan. And we are very, very fortunate to have you with us, Dr. Nelson. I'm gonna let you go ahead and take this away and um, answer questions and have a great time. Thank you for being here. It's up and going. Okay, everyone can still see that? Okay. All right, so like I said, I work at K-State. I work with cats and dogs all day. I'm in our primary care, so I'm like the family doctor for your pets. If you're gonna be a veterinarian, tell you, you gotta like bugs. I kinda like bugs before I was a vet, so this is easy. I love talking about this subject. So we are gonna talk about intestinal and external parasites as well. Why? Because they can cause life-threatening disease in our pets. It can be really, really serious. Some are contagious to people, meaning they are zoonotic. There's your fancy word for that. And they can transmit serious diseases as well to us. And then for veterinarians, parasite products are big, big business because we deal with these on a daily basis. So today we're going to look at some internal parasites. We'll go through that list a little later or really soon here. We're going to look at some external parasites as well. So we're going to try to make it through these in this next hour or so. So I'm going to give you a warning. There are some gross videos and things, so just, I guess, turn away. Um, personally, I find them really cool, but some of you may not be as excited about them as I do. All right, so the first parasite we're gonna talk about are roundworms. This is like one of the most common intestinal parasites that we see in cats and dogs. So it does affect both species. So as we go through these, we're gonna talk about who gets them, dogs or cats or both how they get them. So they can get them through the ingestion of the larvated egg. So there's a little larva still in that egg. Those can be in the environment. So they're out rooting through the dirt, they can pick them up. Eating earthworms, so warning to you that are going to college that do that there about eating earthworms, you can get roundworms from those. Um, ingestions of vertebrates, so like a mouse that's containing the eggs. They can get them from their mom from nursing so they can pass through the milk. And then for some of these, for dogs, they can be passed through the uterus and these puppies can be born with them as well. We're also going to toss around this term called the pre patent period. So that's the time it takes from ingestion of that egg until adults are formed and they start shedding those eggs again. So for roundworms, this can be anywhere from two to four weeks up to eight to 10 weeks, depending on how they acquire these. Why is this important, this pre patent period? Because it determines the frequency of our deworming intervals. Most of these parasites, not all, but the vast majority need more than one deworming, and we have to time it right with that life cycle that's going on. Okay, so who gets most infected with these? So the young are most severely impacted because their immune system is still not that great. What do they do? They can come in with vomiting, diarrhea. These guys have bloated bellies. We were talking about that earlier before this started. They can get impactions in their GI tract. Um, in, in this exception is where the GI tract kind of telescopes upon itself. Think about when you pull a drawstring on sweatpants, it's something like that. It can also migrate through their lungs, give them pneumonia. So these are guys that are just unthrifty, don't look that great, and they can die from these. They kind of look like spaghetti. So that's one thing how we describe them to clients. Are they long and spaghetti looking? They call in and say they're seeing worms. Up to 30% of the population can be affected and that's in the overall young to adults. In puppies and kittens, we assume that all of them have it. And they recommend starting deworming as early as two weeks of age. So we have um, some orphan kittens that come in from time to time and puppies. And so we're gonna start deworming them from roundworms at two weeks of age. As they get older, there's a little more resistance to acquiring these infections or how bad they get infected. You got a lot, a lot of options for treatment. There's oral medications, there's topical medications as well. Okay, are they zoonotic? Yes. So here's a few examples. There's something called visceral larval, mi larval migrants. We acquire these, they can migrate through the lungs of people as well as they can animals and set up pneumonia. There's also ocular larval migrants. And this is a big problem, especially for children in Southeast United States, where these warmer temperatures really keep these parasites going longer in the soil. Not that they can't get them here. They can migrate through the eye and cause blindness. Here you can see one, and this probably isn't as much a roundworm as it is a hookworm. We're gonna talk about them later. 
but definitely these things have been, this is the worm going through the back of the eye. So they can cause blindness as well. So here's a typical puppy. You can see his ribs. So he actually looks kind of skinny, but look at that bloaty belly on him. This guy was full of roundworms. So here's just a few sections again. You see how they look spaghetti looking in the intestinal tract. A client actually sent me a picture of this one with a toothpick for a relative aspect of that. So you can kind of see this is a little shorter one with what that looked like. She also sent me a picture of what was in the litter box as well. This is what these eggs look like. So this is what we're looking for when we set up what's called a fecal float when we're checking for these eggs. Okay, I have a question and I guess the easiest way is going to be to do it in chat. If you guys get it in your chat, we'll have to do these quickly because I got a pretty long presentation. How many eggs can a female roundworm lay in one day? Or if you don't want to be known, just kind of, you're going to know yourself if you guessed it right or not. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Get it, get something in the chat. Let's see if I can see that. Ooh, okay, getting some answers. Got one brave person, another brave person, all right. All right, so let's look at what this number is. One single worm can lay up to 85,000 to 200,000 eggs per day. So these really contaminate our environment. This is a cool picture by one of our parasitologists. Look at all these eggs coming out of this single roundworm. She is jam packed with them. There'll be a, few, a couple more of these questions later. All right, moving on to hookworms. These are another common parasite that we see that affects both dogs and cats. Um, some species affect both, some are species specific. How they get them, kind of like the roundworm, they can get them in through the environment. Cockroaches are carrying those larvated eggs as well. Again, eating a mouse or something like that, that might be carrying that dormant larva. These can also be contracted spread, um, through nursing. And then they can also penetrate the skin. They get their name hookworm because they have these hook-like teeth on their, in their kind of mouth area. Prepatent period is a lot shorter than the roundworms. Um, the shortest two weeks, up to three weeks, uh, two to three weeks, up to 28 days. So kind of like um, dogs with roundworms and cats with roundworms, the young are most severely affected. These things, so they attach to the intestinal lining and they suck blood. These are the vampires, really kind of the intestinal parasite world. So it can cause severe anemia. That blood turns that stool dark and kind of tarry looking. They can get really skinny and fancy word for skinny is emaciated diarrhea. They can also get dermatitis if it goes through their skin, like roundworms cause pneumonia, failure to thrive, and unthrifty appearance and death. Up to 36% of the general population, again, we assume all puppies and kittens have this. And kind of the same treatment options as roundworms and hookworms, oral and topical. One concern we have, we have resistant strains developing, especially with racing greyhounds. There's not much of that going on, but a lot of those tracks have closed. These greyhounds are getting dispersed and their hookworms are not responding to any of the current medications that we have. So this is something we're really, as veterinarians, kind of keeping a watch on. Can you get them? Sure enough, yes, you can. So here's the inside of an intestine. This is, intestines are kind of cut open and laid out. This is that black tarry. This was a severely hookworm infested animal. So you can see all that blood and kind of tarry look. And again, those little hook-like lesions on their, in their mouth areas too. So here's what cutaneous larval migraines looks like. So people who are like walking in the sand in sunny Florida sometimes get this because dogs are out running on the beach. They defecate on the beach. Those eggs hatch out and they're in there. People walk and then they acquire these. You can get into the hands if you're working in soil a lot. This person has it on their belly as well. Really fun looking. Really want that one, don't you? Okay, so how many eggs do hookworms lay per day? So I'll get you guys about 10, 15 minutes, see what you think about that one. If you're having problems with chat, that's okay too, because I have problems clicking on chat sometimes. All right, we got a lot more guesses on this one. Okay, let's see what we got. See how close we are. 25,000 per day, still a lot, but not as many as roundworms. So here's our hookworms, and these are little larvae that are inside those eggs. All right, another one, whipworms, primarily a dog problem. They are really uncommon in North America and they get this worm whipworm because they have this little whip-like look to the end of them. So how do they get those ingesting eggs that have the larva in the environment? 
these have a long prepaint period, up to three months. So our deworming strategy for them is we're going to deworm them now, but again, not until like three months later, which can be really hard for owners to remember because that's kind of far out. So what do we get? Diarrhea that's often streaked with mucus, fresh blood, bloody diarrhea, weight loss, dehydration, and this can also kill them as, as well. Lower prevalence than what we see with roundworms and hookworms. And again, we have oral and topical medications, and it's in some of our heartworm preventives. I should mention we're going to talk about heartworm in a little bit. There's also preventives that help control hookworms and roundworms too. Do people get this one? Very unlikely. This is a severe, severe case of whipworms. Normally, we don't see the worms coming out of the animals. We just find the eggs. And this one was severely infected with whipworms. And as you can see, didn't survive. They're really pretty looking eggs, so they're really cool to see on a fecal flow. So how many eggs do whipworms lay per day? This is your last guessing game here, at least for egg counts. All right, so let's get to the answer. These only lay about 2,000 per day and it's intermittently. So it makes them really hard to find because they might shed on one day and not on another. So if we're trying to prove a case of this, they recommend running three daily fecals in a row to try to catch the shedding of these. All right, tapeworms, a lot of you have seen these before though. Sometimes you find these around the rear end of your pet. These are the dried up, they're called proglottids, so just segments. These are live ones on a fresh stool. So these are kind of short and flat. We describe these as rice. You'll realize there's a lot of references to food when it comes to parasites. So these are the rice-like ones. Who gets them? Both dogs and cats. There's a lot of different species. How do they get them? They have to eat what's called an intermediate host. So the intermediate hosts for some are fleas. Another species, rodents. So rats, mice, rabbits. So our hunters get one species. A lot of them get them from fleas because they eat fleas off of themselves. Uh, Prepaint period as quick as two to three weeks up to a couple of months. Um, most of the time, these don't cause a lot of symptoms. You might get some mild GI upset. You might be itching around the rear end and scooting more. They can scoot for other things too. They have a lot of them. There's rare cases of impaction. However, the prevalence is really, really high. The problem is these don't show up very often on our routine fecals because they're really heavy eggs and they go sink to the bottom. And when we run our fecal floats, we're taking that sample from the top. So a lot of times we get an SOS call from a client going, oh, I'm seeing these, these worms on the stool or there's worms hanging around or these segments hanging around the hair. Oh, we'll find these on exam. So this is a very large attach. All these segments are attached together so they didn't come out individually. This is a case we had come in a few years ago. So those of you, I know you don't see these very much. You all have your cell phones, but hey, so for the cordless phones, this was as long as the cordless phone. This is pretty cool. Okay, so there's a lot of options. Some of the heartworm preventives have them in them as well. There's only one drug that we use to treat for a species called a kind of caucus. Um, are they zoonotic? It's uncommon for most species except for Iconococcus. And we're going to touch on this one. Now, if you happen to eat a flea or accidentally eat a flea or eat a mouse or a rabbit um, that's maybe not cooked very well, yes, you could get tapeworms. Back in the 50s, they actually had these in capsules for people to swallow to help as a weight loss process. They don't do that anymore. Okay. All right. So here's a video of some of these live segments that are just on a table. Here's a dried up one. This was fresh out of an animal that was sitting on our exam table. So they kind of move around, they're kind of gross. All right, so back to Iconococcus, a different type of tapeworm though. We don't see that around here much, which is, which is really good. It causes serious um, disease. It can form large cysts in the liver and lungs. And they kind of call it sheep herders disease sometimes because it's more, most common in people that raise sheep. They have a lot of contact with their with our dogs and it's kind of common in those areas. So how do people get it? Direct contact with the infected dogs. These proglottids are really, really small. People don't always see them. So they're petting their dogs and they go grab some potato chips without washing their hands. It's easy to get infected. And also fecal matter that's containing the eggs. So this is a MR of a brain of a person. This is the large cyst that's in that brain. 
Um, these are some lung tissue. You can see cysts that are in these lungs and you insert surgery on something, but this is a big cyst that's probably right in the lung that looks like they're in the abdomen. This is a mouse. So for perspective, this is a mouse. You can see all these cysts. Here's in the liver, a bunch of these cysts. They're kind of cool looking for glottids, a little different than what our other ones are. For, for um, relative, it, so relative size, these are only like four millimeters to six millimeters long. So here's that little proglottid right there. You can see how easy they are missed. And unfortunately, if you happen to see the egg on a fecal float, they are indistinguishable from those of our other tapeworm species. So these can cause some really serious problems. Okay, coccidia, we were taking, talking about this before the presentation. So who gets these? Dogs and cats, they are host specific or species specific. There's a cat variety, only affects cat. Dog specific, and only uh, affects dogs. How they get it, their cysts and environment. These are pretty much all over. They can also um, ingest a transport host, such as a cockroach. Prepatent period is variable anywhere from four to 23 days. So what do we see? Diarrhea, sometimes bloody, weight loss, dehydration, they don't wanna eat, vomiting, depression, death. Who is most severely affected? Just the very young animals and immunocompromised. Adults, we might find some on routine annual fecals, but they're often asymptomatic. We don't worry about that but we worry about these young guys and immunocompromised. So they're very, very tiny. You're not gonna see these with a naked eye. You're only gonna see this on a microscope. Prevalence, you can look at that range. There's a lot of different treatment options and thankfully, no, they are not zoonotic. And that's a protozoal parasite. So another protozoal intestinal parasite is Giardia. These are really pretty when they stain or when, when we are able to stain them. We say they have like a face it's really not a face, but it, it looks like two little eyes that are there. So they're kind of cool to look at. There's a lot of species. Generally now they think they're fairly species specific, not all, but the ones that dogs and cats get, yes. How do you get them? They form what are called cysts. And I'm gonna show you a picture of these that are in the environment. They need moisture. So water, food, anyone, and then fomites. Anyone wanna unmute, anyone know what a fomite is? So that's when we have these parasites or, or other diseases that are say like on a brush that you brush the animal with and then you go brush another animal with it. So it could be grooming equipment, things like that. So they stick to those and then we transport them that way. Pre-patent period anywhere from three to 10 days. So turnaround time from ingestion to diarrhea and shedding is pretty fast. So diarrhea, weight loss, dehydration, this also causes malabsorption. They really can't utilize their food and maldigestion overall poor doers. So regional differences, I mean, there are times, I swear we just see like every week we get several of these, it kind of runs in batches. If it comes from a pet store or, or, a, or a kennel, especially like a puppy milk kennel, you can about bet we're gonna find GRD with these guys. So there's several, none of them are actually approved for treatment, but we use, what, we use these treatments as what we call off-label treatment. So not it. Can you get Giardia? Yes, people can get Giardia, but it's very rare from their pets. Usually people who get this are out hiking, they drink water from streams, things like that. So this is what the cyst looks like. And again, it's very small. You're not going to see that with your naked eye. And again, here's one of these, um, what do we call troughs. These will be swimming around if you get it fresh out of the animal. This is what they look like stained. This is what they look like unstained. So we'll be looking for those. Okay, so what do we do to try to control intestinal parasites? So there's some general guidelines that come from um, some well-known sources that veterinarians use. They recommend puppies and kittens start being routinely dewormed for roundworms and hookworms. So this first two we talked about, starting at two weeks of age and being dewormed every two weeks, because remember that hookworm life cycle can be as short as two weeks, until they're eight weeks old. And then they should be placed on a monthly prevention that has some sort of efficacy against those parasites. They recommend adult cats and dogs be kept on a broad spectrum, broad spectrum monthly dewormering parasite um, control product. And then also they recommend that fecals on new puppies and kittens two to four times throughout their first year of life. And it might be more frequently for finding parasites that we need to see if our dewormings are working. And then for your adult animals, they recommend semi-annual fecals. So every six months, they recommend fecals on adult animals. Also, um, we want to try to prevent preying and scavenging activities. So keep the cats inside. 
um, or in a fenced in yard, not that bunnies or rats and mice can't come in there or moles, but for the dogs, it keeps them from going out quite as much as well and from getting in the garbage and things like that. Remove feces from the yard or litter box. So cats like to use sandboxes that kids go play in. Um, we wanna keep those covered. We want, if you're finding fecal matter in those, get those out as soon as possible and scooping the litter box in the house as well. And then enforcing leash laws and the dog park rules about, hey, let's remove feces. A lot of apartment complexes have problems with people going out walking their dogs they don't pick up after themselves. So there's a lot of parasite eggs in those environments and at dog parks, things like that. Okay, so we're gonna talk about another internal parasite and that's called heartworms. So heartworms actually live in the main pulmonary arteries and in the heart. So these are kind of in the bloodstream and heart. Dogs are the preferred host that are most susceptible to what's going on. So how do they get them? How do they get these big things? These can grow 12 to 18 inches long. They get a bite from a mosquito that's carrying an infected larva. And I'll show you a video of the larva. They are microscopic. They're in the, um, they get transmitted to that dog. In that six month period after they transmit that infected larva, they grow to be these adults. So we actually can't test for them for at least six to seven months of age. So if they do get infected, what's this cause? Coughing, weight loss, basically heart disease symptoms. Um, but in cats, we can get some different um, symptoms as well. We can get neurologic signs, vomiting, because cats are not the preferred host. So these tend to go to other areas besides the heart and the main pulmonary artery. So then go to the brain, other, other areas like that. There's regional differences. I'm gonna show you a map that's most prevalent in the Southeast and the Mississippi River Valley. Why? You got warmer climates, tons of mosquitoes that are carrying the, there, they're carrying these heartworms. So these dogs and cats get bitten every day by a lot of mosquitoes carrying these parasites. This is a picture of a dog with advanced heartworm disease. This isn't a fat dog. Um, I know it's kind of hard to tell, but her backbone's exposed. This belly is full of fluid. She's having what's called right-sided heart failure. Fluid is starting to back up into her belly and it's because of her heartworm disease. Um, fancy name's called Cable Syndrome for this dog. So are there treatments? Yes, for dogs, cats, Nope, we don't have good treatment options except extraction. And sometimes these, a lot of these cats will die from that. It's expensive and they still might die from treatment, both dogs and cats. Dogs fare better. So prevention is your best option. There's a lot of choices. We have pills, topical. Um, we just, there's been a six month injectable product out for many years. The 12 month just got released this past year. So for people who forget to give like monthly pills, there is an injection, they all, besides heartworm control, various intestinal parasites as well. It's recommended to be used year round, especially like in Kansas, we don't know really when fall ends and when spring starts. It's October, we're still in the 70s. There's still mosquitoes out and you can bet we'll still have them in November. Granted, end of December, January, maybe the earliest week of February, we don't see too many mosquitoes, but after that, it's really unpredictable. And we have what are called microhabitats too. So these um, mosquitoes can hang around the eaves of the buildings where you still have warm temperatures for several weeks past where we've had some freezes. So we do recommend testing on dogs that are seven months of age or older before they start preventive puppies, just go right on to it. Is it zoonotic? No, you're not gonna get this from pet, but there are reported cases of people getting heartworm, not very many, but they're out there. So here is under our microscope, these are all red blood cells. If you've ever seen red blood cells, they're really small. Here's one of the micro, what's called the microfilaria. So it's the baby form of these that are circulating in the blood. Um, there's a certain chemical we can test that will straighten these out. When we look at these live, they're moving around, straighten these out and there's certain um, features that we look for. And then here's a heart that's just, this is chock full. This is a very advanced case of heart home disease. So this is a, these are, this is in a little tiny, what we call a micro hematocrit tube. So we spun this down and when we look at what's called the buffy coat or the clear part, you can see these little microfilarias just squirming around in there. These are what the mosquitoes will pick up. So this is what the adult heartworms produce. The mosquitoes slurp these up from the dog's bloodstream and they kind of go through some different, um, different kind of moltings and things like that inside the mosquito until they're mature enough again to transmit back to the dog and reinfect the dog. So this is a 2019, so every three years, and they just had their triennial meeting in 2019, they released new maps. Here's in 2019. 
So you can see in this Mississippi River Valley, so Louisiana, southeastern Texas are hot spots. Florida has a lot. So all along this southeast coast, heartworms are a big deal. If they're not a heartworm preventive, you can bet those dogs will get heartworm. Kansas is a little different. There's a hot spot right there. Um, Kansas City with the river there tends to get a lot, but we have quite a few in the Manhattan area as well. We see quite a few dogs with heartworm. And it, there's a seasonality. If you have a lot of a lot of rain and it's a warm, moist summer, you're going to get more mosquitoes. You have more more heartworm disease. Okay, here's a question for you: Ringworm, is it a worm? Does anyone know what it is? If you're brave enough, put it on chat. Does anyone know what ringworm really is? Is it a worm? These hairs are fluorescing under what we call a wood slam. Ah. Riley, you got it. And Allie, it is a fungal infection. But a lot of people think it's a worm because it's called ringworm. So those of you who guessed fungal, good job. Okay. So now we're going to move on to some external parasites. We got a lot more fun videos for these. Okay, fleas. I think you all know fleas are around a lot. So these are all pictures I've actually taken of fleas we found. This is an adult flea. This is a juvenile flea. How can I tell? They both look brown and kind of leggy and kind of spiky spicules on them. Juveniles are really dark brown and they are smaller than the adults. Adults have this little translucent kind of abdomen to them there. So this is one where I just took some of the fleas, put them under some tape on a slide. This is an adult, that's a baby. So to kind of show you the difference in those size. So these are juvenile, adult, 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 juvenile. Why does that make a difference? It helps us figure out if we're having resistance to treatment or not. So who gets these? Dogs and cats, there's a lot of species. The cat flea is actually the most common flea that both dogs and cats get. How they get it's in the environment and from other animals. This time of year in Kansas, we see a lot of fleas. Why? The temperatures have come down a little bit. They're in the 70s. It's perfect conditions for these eggs to hatch out. So we just had a dog in yesterday, classic flea allergic dermatitis. Pre-patent period depends on how much humidity and how much warmth is in the area and the temperatures. What do we get? Itching, hair loss, skin infections, secondary to the um, infection, anemia, and even death. We see puppies and kittens die from flea bite anemia. They can also carry other diseases. We talked about the eater flea, you can get a tapeworm. Widespread, where you're not gonna find them is when humidity levels are less than 50%. They do need humidity in the environment to survive. So not gonna really find these in the desert much. Okay. So what is this? This is a piece of white paper and all these little black specks is flea poop. Okay, flea feces uh, for your, all of us, we just call it, there's some flea poop. How do I know that's not just dirt sitting on there? If I add water to that, it turns red. That is digestive blood that the flea is excreting out. So this is how when I have an owner telling me their pet does not have fleas, I brush them off onto the table. I wet down a cotton ball or a white paper towel. And if it turns red, I'm like, that's flea dirt. We often just call it flea dirt. That means your pet recently or very much right now has fleas. This is an example of flea allergic dermatitis. Um, it's not that they can't have skin lesions all over, but they really concentrate on the tail and the lower back. And this, and this isn't yesterday's dog, but this could be yesterday's dog. It was red and white. Um, looked exactly like this dog. My students don't get to see this as much because we have so much better, so many better flea products out there that we don't see as much flea allergic dermatitis. But um, they did point it, they brought it out and said, hey, Dr. Nelson, this one has flea allergic dermatitis. So they pegged that one. So there's a lot of options. There's topical, there's oral. Don't wait till the problem starts. Otherwise you already have a whole bunch in your environment. It will take a while for all those to hatch out and get rid of those. Are they zoonotic? Yes. So you can get cat scratch disease. So what happens if cats have fleas? Um, this bacteria lives in that, that flea dirt. Cats get it on there. They scratch you with their claws that they've been itching with and they can transmit cat scratch disease to you. Some forms of typhus, plague, tapeworms, and people get allergic dermatitis as well. So my, one of my nurses loves to do this. So the little eggs are very white. They look like little pearly white things. She likes to put them in the tape and in a couple of days watch them hatch out. So these are the little eggs, literally like tiny, tiny little pearls that fall on the table and they are hatching out here. So. That's what hatches out into your carpet in the house. Isn't that great? Okay, these are live fleas on a dog. As you can see, they are scurrying around really, really quickly. And this dog 
actually came in because the owner didn't realize it was a black Scotty. Actually didn't realize it had fleas, brought it in for a skin problem. So we're looking at, I'm gonna look at all these fleas. Now, um, Capsar is a product that kills fleas really quickly that we give you know, in the hospital, start killing within uh, 30 minutes. So if you watch this dog, this is about 30, 40 minutes afterwards. This is that same dog you saw the fleas scrambling on. He's all agitated because these fleas are scurrying all over. Their synapses are going crazy because this chemical is affecting them. It's not affecting the dog. What's affecting the dog is the fleas running all over the place. And so he'll calm down after an hour or two after all the fleas are dead. But you can see how agitated it can get as we start getting a rapid die off of all those fleas. Okay, this is a puppy that came in. It was what we call a good sand puppy. Someone found it. Um, I can't even make his, his gums look as white as what it was. This puppy had severe flea bite anemia. When it came in, my poor nurse who was holding it, um, the fleas were just jumping off all over. I mean, this puppy was crawling in them. So these are what are called hematocrit tubes. When I showed you that picture of the heartworm microfilaria, this is what we spun down. So this, let, this lets us check for, to see if they have the right amount of blood volume. So are they anemic or not? So for perspective, this is a normal dog. So just kind of look at the red. This is a nice amount, probably a 40% hematocrit, what we call hematocrit. This is the plasma that's left over. Look at this puppy. Not a lot of red blood cells in this puppy. And this puppy came very, very close to dying. And with the miracle, we were able to quickly give it a transfusion. We literally shot the blood into it. Normally you wouldn't do it that fast. And this puppy actually survived the tilt the table. But he was like white as a sheet. He was so pale. All right, ticks. I hate ticks. I'm just going to say that right now. They can be very pretty, but I hate ticks. So there's a lot of different species. This is called a lone star tick. This is the most common tick in Kansas. Gets its name because it's like the lone star state, you got that one little dot on there. Okay, how do they get them? Tall grass, kennels. There's a certain species of ticks that likes to live in the walls of homes and kennels. Most of them are outside. They want tall grass, shady areas. Unlike, um, contrary to popular belief, they do not fall out of trees. You're gonna find them like walking through the cons of prairie and through these wooded areas, but they're on the bushes and the grass, they're not in the trees. And they do what's called questing. They sit out on the tip of a blade of grass or the tip of a leaf and they wait for an animal to walk by them and then they just hitch a ride as they go by, it's called questing. Okay, free paint and period varies between the species. Um, they need other animal species, many of these do, to complete their life cycle. So this long star tick needs turkey and deer around to help complete their life cycle and what we have plenty of in Kansas, turkey and deer. Okay, um, some of them, there's some species that require like lizards as their life cycle, things like that. Okay, what do we get? Itching, hair loss, skin infection, again, anemia if there's enough. Paralysis, it's called tick, um, tick paralysis, and even death. And they carry a lot of other diseases. This is what's scary about ticks. Prevalence is regional. So some ticks that have only lived in one region, those territories are expanding. So that's what's kind of scary. So diseases we may not have in Kansas right now, some of them are creeping closer. And then also climate. And again, the host animals influence what kind of tick species we have. And different species can transmit different disease. Okay, so treatment options, we have a lot. Topical, oral, again, like the fleas, don't wait till there's a problem to start. You want to prevent it before there's actually a, an issue. And these are a couple of other, again, here's a lone star tick. Here's this fancy name. Derma Center, we see quite a few of these in Kansas as well. Are they zoonotic? Yes. What can you get from ticks? Rocky Mountain spotted fever, so can our dogs. Lyme disease, we don't, in the Manhattan area where I'm at, we don't have Lyme disease. Um, there's been some cases like Southeast Kansas, a few. Most of the time we think of Northeast United States. Tularemia can be transmitted. This can be very bad if you don't know you have it. And the, and the physicians, that's not on their radar to treat because there's only certain antibiotics that treat that. We see this a lot because cats get it from actually from rabbits that they kill, but the rabbits get it from the ticks. Ehrlichiosis, dogs get it, people get it as well. So lots of bad, and there's more diseases than that that they can spread, so lots of bad diseases. All right, ear mites. Oh, I love showing these to clients, and kids love to look at these. So this is an example of some of their eggs. This is the actual mites, so the eggs are almost as big as the mites. We see a lot of brown debris in these ears. So they get some dogs and cats. If you have ferrets, your ferrets can get them and rabbits can as well. Um, but we're keeping this mostly the dogs and cats for this talk. How do they get it? Close contact with an infected animal. Pre-patent day, about rut to the shy over two weeks to four weeks. 
So what do we get? Head shaking, scratching the ears, odor, dark discharge, scabby skin. Cats, a lot of times we get scabby skin from it as well. Prevalence is super common in cats and kittens. We see it a lot. We see it in dogs too. Um, in fact, I just had a dog in the other day, a puppy that had a golden retriever puppy. So we see it tons in cats. This is an adult cat that had it and she's scratching. This actually looks good. It looked worse before we started treatment. Um, she had a lot of pus on here and she was scratching herself into a bloody mess because, and you can kind of see the dark debris in her ear on that one. These are some of the mites that came out of her. And this picture I like, this is your ear mite. This is the egg it's getting ready to, to lay. So kind of cool to see those. So you got a lot of treatment options, topical that goes onto the skin or the skin that go in the ears. Um, a lot of times they have to come in and have a veterinarian and get these professionally cleaned out. Uh, and they usually have to be heavily sedated to do this. So they're so itchy and so uncomfortable. A lot of them have secondary yeast and bacterial infections in the severe cases that we have to treat as well. Zoonotic, rare cases. And the thing is that ear mites don't like to live in people. There are some scientists several years back ago that thought it'd be cool to see what happened if he put ear mites in his ears. And what he documented is he heard all these crawly sounds that sounded really loud in there. Um, and he had a lot of itchiness, but eventually it went away because again, they don't like to live in people. So here's a video, it's very short. As some of these, we have mineral oil. So we'll take a swab from ear, put these in mineral oil. You can see these guys kind of crawling around. So think about those crawling in the ear canal and think about their hearing that too. Their, their hearing is even better than ours. That just makes me kind of go, yeah. Okay, lice. Fortunately, I don't see a lot of lice because except if we have what we call the good Sam animals. So this was a, what's called the good Sam kitten. These are ones that people bring in, they find them on the road. Um, this one, these two came from a barn. So you can see this little white things on the fur. These are actually the nits. So just like your people getting nits, we found the nits. And I haven't seen lice in years. I'm looking at this guy, it looks like nits. So they are species specific. Dogs get dog variety, cat get cat varieties, and they don't give them to you. So how do they get them? Contact with an infected animal, same species, or again, fomites. So just like kids can get them shearing combs, cats, we can get these sharing grooming instruments between the animals. Prepatent periods around three weeks. They're often asymptomatic. Cats can get really heavy infestations. They can get restlessness. They get a ruffled coat, hair loss, itching. So who's going to be most prevalent for this? It's going to be, again, the very young, old, debilitated animals. Um, those like hoarding situations, unsanitary environments, we're going to see them come out of there. Colder weather, rarely found if they're on routine flea and tick preventive. And so, so many of my patients are on flea and tick preventive, which is why I don't see it very often. Now, people who do shelter medicine um, go out and expand and inspect the courting situations, they're going to see a lot more of these. Okay, so this is that same cat. You can see the nits on there, but this is what this kitten looked like. So I know it's a little fluffy, but it was really skinny. You could feel all the bones in this fluff. And look, this pot belly also had a lot of intestinal parasites. So he wasn't in very good shape when he came in. These are what we actually got off these kittens. So pictures under the microscope. So this is a knit that's attached to the hair. So that's what those look like. You get developing, developing louse that's in there. These were the adults that came off. This is an adult that's right, right by a knit that it laid. Okay, and there again, here's some of the adults, what they look like in color. This is on our table. Again, with some of those eggs that are out there that had already fallen off the fur. So there's a lot of treatment options. Again, most flea and tick products will take care of this. And again, are they zoonotic? No, thank goodness, they're species specific. Okay, now we're gonna talk about maggots. Everyone loves maggots. Okay, they come from flies. So dogs and cats can both get them. People get them too. Um, how do they get them? So there's certain flies, the blow flies, lay eggs, usually in festering wounds or areas that are soiled by urine and feces. You might go, okay, how do they get soiled? These longer hair cats and dogs, if they're not feeling good, don't wound themselves. They get a lot of matted hair around their anus and things like that. And so flies are attracted to them. So pre patent period from laying that egg to hatching out is as short as 24 hours. So what do we get? They have a really distinctive odor. I can almost tell you before I look that I'm gonna find maggots on a patient that comes in. And you'll find the visible moving larva. I'm gonna have a really fun video for you for that. You might see eggs attached to the hair. Some of the pets that they're really debilitated might be depressed, lethargic, stop eating. So when we see these is when the flies are out. So it's gonna be the warmer months when it's hot and moist in those environments. And who gets it again? So once they're consistently dirty or 
Um, the video I'm going to show, this was an older dog that someone thought was being nice to let her go lay out in the sun. But what they didn't realize is this dog couldn't get around and move. And, and she had a lot of urine soiling, so she got a bad case of maggots. So I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so different infections from allergies, again, can predispose them to. So what do we have to do? We have to physically remove these. There are some medications that will kill the feeding maggots, but we still have to remove the other ones. Um, we have to get rid of the icky tissue. So we've got to go in and kind of clean them up. And then you want to make sure you're keeping these um, patients indoors and monitored for signs of infection. Is it zoonotic? No, you're not going to get them from your pet. But physicians see these people again, they're debilitated. Sometimes obese where skin folds are really thick and full, um, heavy and they get some of those eggs in there. So this is kind of the grosser video. But this is that dog again, she just literally can't get up. She has really bad hips. And this is just some of the maggots that were falling off of her when we put her on the table. So we got her cleaned up, we got her better, but it was pretty gross when she came in. Okay, does anyone know what these might be? I'll check the chat. We all live for these if you're a veterinarian. Hey, there you go. Yeah, it's a type of bot fly. Okay, well, you're in my chat thing. It's called cuterebra. Okay, so where do they come from? The cuterebra are the bot flies. So those of you who got that right, good job. And they're super fun. So before we start doing this, um, usually what we find is there's kind of like a nodule. And if you get the hair away from it, you're gonna see a hole, call it the blowhole, because they need oxygen. And if you really look, you'll see these guys moving underneath. Okay, and they have these little, it's hard to see on this, little tiny spines on them too. So dogs and cats are actually act, what are called accidental hosts. So what happens? We see these way more in cats than we do in dogs. Not that a dog can't get it. So the cats are laying around a rabbit burrow, you know, they're hunting, especially kittens. We see a lot of kittens with these, what they call the first stage maggots. They go through the mouth, eyes. So they're going to go through an opening, so nostrils, mouth, anything that's an opening. They don't actually penetrate the skin. And then that third stage larva develops in the subcutaneous tissue, so under the skin. But sometimes they go to what we call aberrant migration. They'll go to the like brain or spinal cord. So we can see these guys coming in seizuring or not able to walk or the respiratory system. Repatent period is three to six weeks. So again, they have a really distinctive cyst that we see in the skin. Again, they can cause also neurologic and respiratory signs. Most of the time we just see this more likely to occur during warming months because we need those bot flies out here. We have to be really careful when we remove these. If we rupture these while they're still in the patient, it can cause an anaphylactic reaction and the potential to die. Um, these are just a couple of chemical names that we can give. So are they zoonotic? No, you're not going to give them from pet, but there are cases of people having these as well. Okay, so this is a kind of a cool case. This was um, one of our orphan kittens. She was only two weeks old. You, ever, you probably can't see me. If you ever see a two-week-old kitten, they're really tiny. Okay, so you're gonna have to watch. You can kind of see this is the cuter river right here, and you'll kind of see it kind of bubbling around, and you'll see it kind of there. You go swish around. What happened was one of my nurses actually was taking care of this kitten at home, and she took it in on emergency at night because all of a sudden this kitten spiked the fever. And they couldn't figure out why, and they and so she brought her back in the morning for me to look at and. We're thinking all these other like viral diseases, bad things that kittens can get. And we're looking over and I felt the tiniest of scab. I mean, it was like a pinpoint. And when we pricked it, we found that thing. So me being old and my associate that was helping me being kind of just slightly younger than me with our bifocals on, <laughs> we're trying to pluck this thing out of this kitten. And you know, there's not too many things you can sedate a two week old kitten with. And we had to kind of make that opening a little bigger. This is a flea. So fleas are tiny if you've ever seen fleas. This is how little this cuter reaper was. It was like microscopic. We still have that, we keep that. So we call it the world's smallest cuter reaper because I've never seen one that tiny before. Really fun for us. Kitten got better once we got it out, put her on antibiotics, she recovered quite well. All right, sarcoptic mange. Let's take a look at these guys. So these primary effect dogs, there's some species in cats, but pretty much we think about this as a dog parasite. They get it through direct contact with an infected dog or fomites again. Pre-patent period is about three weeks. They get really thick in skin. These guys itch, like they'll sit in the office and they're just itching. You can't make them stop. 
That leads to secondary bacterial infections, self mutilation and bloody skin lesions. This was courtesy of one of our, of our dermatologists. She found some of these on the scraping. Here's some eggs. Here's the, and then there's the mite. Prevalence is relatively common. Um, this is that same dog they did scrapings on. So this is a beagle. Look how thick in the skin is on its face. And on, this is on its belly and under its armpits, like thick plaques of skin. So there's only actually two approved treatment options. Um, however, there some of the newer flea and tick products that we call off-label will clear this up nicely. So besides getting our flea and tick prevention, it, it covers a lot of mites as well. A lot of times these guys have secondary infections we have to treat as well. Okay, can people get it? Yes, you can get it from your dog. Again, they don't like to live in you, but they can make you very itchy for a few weeks. So a lot of times your physician will prescribe a cream to put on them. People have their own form of this, we won't go about that, but they see outbreaks a lot in like nursing homes, things like that. But the dog form doesn't like to live in people, so you'll only be uncomfortable for a few weeks. And let, thankfully, it doesn't live very long off the dog either. Okay, this is another kind of mange called Demodex, and they're really cool. They're like little cigars with legs when we find them on skin scrapings. So we have what are called long body, which is this one, and they are species specific. There's a type for dogs, type for cats, and then it's short body, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, and you'll see why they're called short body. So these long body ones, pretty much they get them from mom when they're nursing. They're really not considered contagious, but they do get them from mom when they're nursing. Short bodied, however, very different story. So the short bodied cats are contagious. They can spread from cat to cat. We just had a case the other day. They're really hard to find. The way we diagnosed it, fecal sample, because they groom themselves, they ingested these mites, we found them on the fecal sample. There's our prepatent day. So dogs, patchy hair loss, a lot of times not infecting, it might be not infected, it might be red. Sometimes they're itching, most of the time they're not. In cats, sometimes they're itching and hair loss from over grooming, sometimes they're asymptomatic. So dogs common, especially young and immunocompromised. A healthy immune system keeps these in check. We have our own type of demodectic mange that lives on our eyelashes, you like that. So, um, but in dogs, usually we're seeing this when their immune system cannot keep them in check because most of them have them. Cats are, we don't see it very often. And we are, very rarely do we see these. We see them quite a bit in dogs. Not as much now with some of our new flea and tick products. So tip, so dips used to be the only approved treatment, still is the only approved treatment. Um, besides some of our topical medications and then some of our oral flea and tick products. There's no treatments labeled to treat the cats. So again, we're using these newer flea and tick products that are working well for clearing them up. Are they zoonotic? Thankfully, no. Okay, this is short bodied. So you can see that it has a stubbier kind of tail end to it. There's the long bodied. So this is the, infect, the um, one that can be transmitted between cats. This cat's over grooming. This is the part it can reach and what it had was Demodex, what we call Gadoy. This dog has, this is puppy, has a long body. Sometimes it's also known as red mange. You can see how red that will sometimes make, turn the skin. A lot of times, however, all we see is hair loss and it's not red. So this is where we pluck some hair from a dog. You can see that long bodied mite right along the hair. So we'll often do that diagnosis as a little one kind of flipping its hind end up. So we are able to um, not do skin scrape and just do it by plucking a few hairs. This is cuterebra, or sorry, not cuterebra, short body demodex in a cat. So this is a fresh scraping, so it's still alive. You can see it moving under there. So this is the contagious one or the short body. Okay, chiggers. A lot of you might be familiar with chiggers. You live in Kansas. They're kind of cool because what sets them off when we see them, um, they have these two little red dots that are right up there. So both dogs and cats can get them. How do they get them? Like us, walking through grass, little line vegetations. They're close to the ground. They need high humidity levels to survive. We're not going to see them around much longer. There's our prepatent period. Symptoms, just like us, red bumps on the skin, belly between the, where we see them a lot in the dogs, and we see this more in dogs than cats, the belly between their toes, they can be really itchy. That's what pruritus means. And they often get secondary bacterial infections. So prevalence is regional. We have students come from other parts of the United States to school here, and they've never heard of chiggers, so they came to Kansas. They quickly found out what they were when they're out in the grass sitting down. So normally we see these mostly in the summer and the fall because again, we need warm humid tips. So many flea and ticks ki products kill them, but the problem is they've already bitten the patient. So we need to find things that repel them. Quite frankly, for cats, we don't have very many safe options. A lot of options for dogs, but not for cats. So they are equal opportunity feeders. So many, maybe some of you have had legs that have looked like that or somewhere else. They also like to be like around the waistband of your underwear and things. 
here's the belly of a cat. It looks a lot like the leg on this guy. So this is not our, typically what we see. We see this way more in dogs, but this cat had a severe case of chickers. Okay, so what do we do for external parasites? Uh, we have a lot of topical and oral medications. Some kill, some repel and kill, and it kind of depends on what parasite we're targeting, which one of these or both that we might need to use. Sometimes we have to treat premises, the home and the yard. Again, it depends on the parasite. We have to treat secondary skin or other infections like systemic infections that ticks might transmit or skin infections from the flea bites or the chiggers. We wanna to try to keep our pets away from sources where they can be. So weak, sick, debilitated animals, keep them indoors, especially in the, well, really any time of the year because they don't cope with the cold very well either. But remember, if they're out and sitting in out there and they can't get away from the flies, we're gonna deal with maggots with these guys. Keep them groomed, check daily for parasites. So be checking for ticks, be checking for parasites. You might need a hygienic clip around the rear end area under the tail of some of these longer haired cats and dogs to keep fecal matter from adhering to them. And again, the great thing is over these like past five, six years, some of these newer flea and tick products also are showing efficacy off label for a lot of these mites that we deal with. So internal and external parasite control plays a really important role. We deal with these every day, even in the winter. There are a lot of products on the market, but they're not all created equal. So these three dogs came in several years ago and they used an over-the-counter flea and tick product. Every single one of these got a chemical burn where it was applied. It was the same product. These are all, these two were related. This was a different litter, but all from the same household. They put this product on and this is what it did to their skin. So what do you do? The best thing is discuss options with your veterinarian because there's a lot of great things out there. But like some of our really good new flea and tick preventives, we have to be careful or not use them at all in dogs and cats that have seizures. So we need to kind of know the history in order to give the best advice to what product we want to put your pet on. And so now you get to go home after we do some questions. Don't eat any earthworms, remember that, or fleas. You don't want to get a tapeworm. I really don't recommend it for weight loss. And when you think that when you're eating your rice or spaghetti, Think of tapeworms and roundworms, okay? All right, let me stop the share. Um, I'm gonna leave this up for any questions. If you guys have them, you can unmute and ask your questions. Don't be shy. Shy group. Feel free to type it in the chat box and you can read it right off your chat. <laughs> that means I gotta bring up chat. Let me do that. Okay, we can do that as well. Remember, your name's still associated, so it might be easier just to say it out loud. You guys did a really good job with your with some of your questions and answers, having the right answer. That was really good. I have actually uh, one quick question. Thank you. Way to break the ice. Okay. No um, so I've always wondered, like, with um kind of treatments and everything i know there's some parasites and uh infections and such where they kind of can be resistant to the product being used uh -huh. and in, in that case what would you do for that like how would you handle that situation can you tell me kind of which parasite you're thinking about because it depends I, on yeah i am um kind of like say with fleas like say you that's hoping certain... you're going to ask me that yeah <laughs> so if you remember the slide i showed you with the fleas under the tape so one thing we do when we're trying to determine if it's resistance or maybe they're not applying the product right um, or just a large amount in their environment, we're going to flea comb or get the product called Capstar to get a lot of the fleas off. And we're going to see what stages of fleas come off those animals. If we see a lot of adults, as well as those immature ones, remember the adults are bigger, more translucent, the little ones are small and dark. That means one or two things, one of two possibilities. Either we truly have resistance going on and we need to switch the product or they're not treating everyone in the house. So we run into this a lot. They treat their dogs because they're going in and out, but they don't treat their indoor cats. But a flea itches a ride on the dog and before it has time to have the, whatever you're using for preventive effect, it pops onto the cat. Now all of a sudden the cats are a permanent source in that household. So it's really not a failure of the product, it's a failure of they're not treating everybody. So we have to ask a lot of those questions. Now, 
If all we find are the majority are those little juvenile stages, your product's working. What's happening is there's a mass hatching. So they have, they have kind of like a moth's life cycle. You've got your egg, they hatch into a larva, larva um, go into a pupal stage. And then when those environmental temperatures are right, those pupa burst open, you got your fleas, I mean, your immature fleas. So again, this time of year, we have tons in the environment. So what's happening is animals, especially the dogs, are going outside to do their job, do the duty. And then they pick up a whole bunch of these immature fleas that jump on them. They come in the house and the owners are like, oh, there's all these fleas crawling on him. Well, the thing is, nothing kills them within like minutes. It takes usually at the fastest one, still a few hours, two to four hours. And so, but in the owner's mind, the product's not working. We're really just going out and bringing a new batch of fleas in. Because if we don't find any adults, none of those are turning into adults. They're not surviving and turning into adulthood. So that's where we have to kind of play detective. The same thing with ticks. We see dogs coming in with a lot with dead ticks, as long as some live ones, but really not very many are engorged. The product's working. Ticks take even longer to kill than fleas. But they come in with a lot of engorged ticks. The product may not be the right product to use. We need to switch to something else. So I hope that answered it. It's a good question because you do. You have to kind of play detective to figure out, is it really resistant so we need to switch? Or is it just the client's not complying with what we're telling them to do? Or an overwhelming amount in the environment. Okay. Thank you. Excellent question. I can get There's one that popped up in the chat from Reagan Bush. Yes. Ah, oh, that's a good question too. So why do cats have so little options for treatment? It's a really good one. So unfortunately, they don't have all the what I want to say, enzymes in their liver that are needed to metabolize some of these compounds. So let's say a chemical called permethrin, which we use a lot on dogs because it has some repelling activities. That is toxic cats. Actually, we had a cat come in that we suspected toxicity yesterday from permethrin because it was twitching and seizing. And the owner couldn't remember what she put on it. And I'll that she went, picked up a product for dogs and put it on the cat. And that's why it developed symptoms. So yeah, they cannot literally metabolize some of these agents, so they're toxic for them. So we do finally have some better ones with the newer, um, some of the newer topicals that came out. But yeah, it's a real big problem. Don't have near as many options. Cats are not small dogs. Are some There's another such, one. Yeah, are some preventives such as NexGuard and HeartGuard better than others like Semperica Trio? Well, that depends. That's a really good question as well, because basically what we have to do is we have to get history from the client, you know, what's going on. Um, based on fecals, what kind of intestinal parasites are they dealing with, as well as fleas and ticks. So you've got three different products. NextGuard only does fleas and ticks. Those are great products. One that will off-label do some of those mites. HeartGuard is a heartworm prevention. And if you have HeartGuard Plus is where it gets tricky. It also helps with roundworms and hookworms. And most people have HeartGuard Plus. But then you've all seen the ads for Sympirica Trio like I have on TV. So it has a chemical kind of like NextGuard. It's in the same family, so fleas and ticks. It has a dewormer reason like in all of them for roundworms and hookworms. And it has another um, agent in it that helps for heartworm prevention. So Sympirica Trio is nice because it does a lot of things, but it's not doing like whipworms or tapeworms. Um, so there's a couple of things that's lacking. So for us, we usually put dogs on two different preventives. One of them like a NexGuard or Brevecta, these newer ones that does fleas and ticks well. And then my preference is a heartworm preventive that also does hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, and tapeworms. That's why we know a lot of dogs have tapeworms and they're hard to find on fecals. So you really, it, and, but if an owner can't remember to give a monthly product, we might use one of the injectable heartworm preventives. So we really have to ask history questions and talk to the client, get some feedback, but what can you actually do? Can you actually give a pill to your cat? Can your old arthritic fingers actually work? The, we have this problem a lot with older people. They can't pop the tops or open the packages for the topicals. So this is where you develop that working relationship with your client and then decide what's the best option for their pets. Okay, another question. Does the dark buildup in the ears tell you they have ear mites? Are there other things that cause dark buildup? Good question. Yes, there are. So the automatic, especially for a cat, is we always go, it's going to be ear mites. But no, some, and that's the majority of them cats. 
In dogs, a lot of times it's a yeast infection that can be secondary to allergies. I like three dogs emergency come in with ear infections that flared up overnight because it's allergy season for them right now. So yeast infections can do it. Um, might have a dog that has a tumor that's making it have excessive and usually it's secondary infection causing that. That demodectic mange that usually we just find in the skin occasionally affects the ear canals. So we can see it cause that dark debris. So what do we have to do? We do swabs checking for mites and we do cytology to see if there's bacteria or yeast in there. Because no, you can't literally usually tell just by looking. I can guess that maybe there's yeast along with maybe ear mites in an ear, but I really have to do cytology to confirm it. Any other questions? I know some of you are having to leave. I said some good questions. And they're ones our clients ask us all the time too. A lot of them bring their pets in. My dog is ear mites. Yep, no ear mites. We're finding something else going on. Okay, thanks for all your great questions and your participation. I know it's harder to do in Zoom. We're kind of getting used to it because we had to do it for a year when everyone was at home, but still better. I love doing this in rounds where we're all face to face and we can talk. This is the second best of rounds. Okay. Well, I want to. Thank Dr. Nelson for being here. Uh, I hope that many of you will tune in for our next vet, vet med lecture. There are three in the fall and three in the spring, September, October, November, and we have February, March, and April. Uh, our next one is November 10th, taking the fear out of the veterinary visit and why it matters with Dr. Boyer. That'll um, be a good one. Yeah, but you know, it's, you're, you're at home with your pet and you see them distressed, you want them to feel better. So don't fear going to the vet. <laughs> um, get some help. Um, it's always, always a good idea to have a good working relationship and have your pet um, have those annual checkups so you can have those conversations to be more proactive with your pet care than, than reactive. Exactly. Okay, hey, yeah, you guys have a good lineup of speakers and topics. Yeah. Okay. All right. Study hard. Maybe I'll see you in a few years. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you much. Thank you all for joining us. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.